over which our learning algorithm searched the best hypothesis to fit the trained data, right? And in the consistent learning, well, we assume, okay, your learning algorithm is so powerful, like for every training set, you're guaranteed to find a hypothesis which gives zero training error, right? So that actually implies that your hypothesis, your target function must be inside the hypothesis um, as well. Otherwise, uh, you can always find a data set which, which can differentiate your target function and any hypothesis in the hypothesis phase, right? So uh, this is called agnostic learning. Why? Because uh, we are agnostic about where the target function stays in, right? So <clears throat> the, the critical uh, difference or the critical point we should be aware of agnostic learning is that because the target function is no longer inside is no longer necessarily uh, take a stay inside the hypothesis space. That means your training error is not guaranteed to be zero. Okay. So that's the that's the that's the key difference from the uh, uh, consistent learning. So, uh, but uh, our objective, our training objective, is still there. We still want to uh, minimize the training error. Right? We want to make the training error to be as small as possible, so that we expect our True error, in other words, the generalization error uh, to be as small as possible as well. And that's the that's the that's the strategy for the agnostic learning. Right? So <clears throat> the competition learning theory, like the goal of the competition learning theory about agnostic learning, is that okay, so if I can get a training error, right, how can I derive some kind of bound? A description about the generalization error based on the training error. In other words, can I use the training error to estimate some bound for the generalization error or the true error? And how do we do that? The important tools we're going to use is called tail bounds. Tail bounds basically are just describing the chance that the random variables deviate from its mean. So we know that from statistical uh, classes, we know that uh, most likely the random variables will stay around the mean, right? From more around its mean, right? Like, um, if uh, your random variable wants to get quite far away from uh, its mean, the chance is pretty low, right? And, in, and intuitively, the far away your random variable takes the value from its mean, the lower the chance. Right? So tail bounds. Are used to characterize uh, the bounds for, for, for such kind of chances. We introduced uh, several. Uh, we introduced uh, several commonly used uh, uh, bounding inequalities like Markov inequality, chap chap inequality, and so on. Right. So the chap chap inequality is saying that okay, for any random variable, the probability the random variable take a value. Uh, K standard deviation away from its mean, this probability is less than or equal to 1 over T squared. Right? So from this inequality, you can say uh, the larger the K, the smaller the probability. It actually implies that, okay, uh, if you want to uh, take some value uh, very far away from me, uh, the chance is very, very low. But the uh, the most important inequality we're going to use is called Hopkins inequality. Okay. So Hopkins inequality upper bounds how much the average of a set of random variables differs from its expected value. So it's talking it's talking about the average of a set of IAD random variables. So suppose I have m random variables x1, x2 to xm. Right? IAD means that they are identically they are independently identically distributed, like they're not related to each other, but they follow the same distribution. And of course, because they are ID, the expectation of each random variables uh, is the same. We can denote it by P, right? At the same time, we average all these M random variables. So we can sum over X1 to XM and divide it by M, right? So this is called P bar. 
p-bar is essentially an empirical estimate of the expectation, right? So just like uh, imagine you're doing uh, a, a torsing experiment of course, right? So you want to estimate the chance you see the has. Right? How can I do that? I know that internally you've got some chance, right? Which is expectation. But you want to estimate this chance how to do that. You just toss the coin like for 10 times or, or 100 times, right? You just calculate how often uh, the heads are at, right? And just calculate the ratio of the heads uh, over the total number of the torsies, right? So this is the average, right? Because each core tossing, the outcome you can view is a binary random variable. Right? If you have a heads up, the random variable takes value of one. Otherwise, it takes value of zero, right? And uh, the ratio of the hazard is actually the average of this uh, random variables, right? And but the expectation of the hazard is essentially the probability that indicator of binary random variable takes one, right? So you can see that p bar, the average of these uh, random variables, is an empirical estimate of the true expectation or true mean. Okay? So <clears throat> this one, just be careful, this one is still a random variable. Why? Why is this still a random variable? P bar. Because it's just the sum of a bunch of other random variables? Yes, exactly right. So remember, p bar is a summation over a set of other random variables. In other words, it's a function of random variables. Right? So the function of random variable is another random variable. So p bar is kind of, we can view it as a random estimate of some uh, uh, ground truth quantity, which is the mean of each random variable. Right? So now we have these preconditions. According to Hawkins' utility, we claim that the true mean is types of errors, right? Well, no, the training error is actually the ratio of the mistakenly classified examples by our hypothesis, right? So if you write it down, this is essentially an average of a set of uh, binary random variables. Why? So. You go over each training example. Suppose you have n training examples in total, right? So for each example SI, you're gonna look at the prediction of the ground truth function and prediction made by a hypothesis. Right? If they're not equal, then this indicator is simply one, right? Otherwise, it's zero. So now you go through every training example. You got n binary random variables values. Right? Now you just average them. That's how we tackle the training error, right? And then this indicator is essentially run of error. Why? Why we should view each indicator over the training examples as a run of error? Any thought? Yeah, because uh, the training input xi is a random variable, right? Remember, training examples are sampled from some underlying data distribution, right? right? So if you collect the training data this time, you actually got samples from the data distribution D, right? If you, got, if you collect another set of training examples, uh, they're different. Although they are also sampled from the same data, data distribution. So the training example itself is a random variable. And this indicator, this binary variable, essentially is a function of those uh, training examples. Right? So this indicator is binary as well. So that's why we can view the training error as an average of those uh, IID binary random variables. Why they are, they are independent? Because, uh, 
you're assuming each training examples are sampled independently from the train, uh, from the data distribution. Okay. So now, if you look at the definition of the generalization error, it is actually the probability that for any example sampled from this data distribution D, your prediction is different from your ground truth label. Right? So this is actually, you can view it as, OK, when I toss a, toss a corner, what, what is the probability uh, you see the head up? You see the head up. Right? So if you view this as the binary right variable, this probability is essentially the binary variable, variable takes one, right? And remember, xi and x, they are all sampled from the data distribution. They, are, they have the same distribution. In other words, this uh, true error is essentially the expectation of each binary variable used in calculating the training error. Does it make sense? Right? Any, any question? It just follows the definition. Right? The true error is a chance that you make a wrong prediction. Right? And this chance is essentially the expectation that your binary variable, this binary variable means, uh, it's one meaning that you make a wrong prediction, it's zero meaning that you don't, it doesn't, you don't make, uh, you make a correct prediction. Right? So for any binary variable, its expectation, or its mean, is equal to the probability that binary variable is one, right? And now, looking at the definition of the training error, you see that we simply average uh, the set of uh, binary indicator random variables, right? This is essentially an empirical estimate of the true error. Any question? Everyone's good? Okay, great. So, now, if you want to know what is the probability that the true error is, say, more than epsilon away from the empirical error, we can apply the Hopkins inequality as directly. Okay. So, here, the true mean, now, is a uh, true error, right? The generalization error. And the empirical estimate of the mean, or empirical mean, is now replaced by the training error, right? So this is just a straightforward application, because uh, the training error is an empirical estimate of the true error. So apply a confidence equality, we, we immediately get this result. So now, we got our first uh, important conclusion about the advanced learning. For any specific hypothesis H, we know that the true error of H is more than epsilon away from the training error is bounded above by this exponential term. This is done by applying Hopkins inequality directly without any change. But now, we should extend it to a more general case, right? Because our learning is conducting a search over the hypothesis space, right? We actually do not know which particular hypothesis is going to be selected before the training proceeding, right? So similar to what we have done for the consistent learning, we want to make a more general statement about this chance, meaning that want to know what is the probability that there exists a hypothesis in a hypothesis space such that its true error is epsilon away from the twin error. What's the probability of that? The same upper bounds. So now you can just uh, add up all those uh, upper bounds together, which is equivalent to multiplying this bound by the size of the hypothesis space H. So actually, we use exactly the same trick 
as we did for the consistent learning to get this uh, general statement. Okay. So basically, this statement is general in that uh, we're talking about any agnostic learning algorithms. Meaning that as long as you put a setting agnostic learning, right, no matter what kind of uh, uh, learning algorithm you're going to use, we can claim that, okay, uh, the learning hypothesis, the probability, the probability of this true error, bigger epsilon away from true error is not bounded by this. Because we cannot assume how this learning algorithm will select the hypothesis or search over the hypothesis space. So it applies to all kinds of uh, learning algorithms for this announced learning setting. So next, we're going to conduct the same analysis as before. So we want our hypothesis, uh, the true error of learning hypothesis, uh, uh, to be uh, close to the training error. This chance to be as large as possible. Other, uh, in other words, we don't want, okay, after, uh, after the training procedure, my learning hypothesis of whose travel is very different from the training error. Okay. We want the probability that your true error, x away from the training error, to be smaller than some given threshold C delta. How can we achieve this? We just uh, ensure that the upper bound of this uh, probability will be less than or equal to delta. Right? And then the remaining thing is just to solve this inequality in terms of number of training examples. M. And now we can get the sample complexity bound for the agnostic learning setting. Well, specifically, if m is bigger than this, like 1 over 2 epsilon squared, logarithm size hypothesis space plus logarithm 1 over delta, then we guarantee that the chance that the true error of your learned hypothesis epsilon away from the training error is lower or smaller than the designated threshold delta. Right? So this is reasonable. Why? So you can see that the more training examples, the, the, the more, the smaller epsilon you want, right? So mean that you want, uh, uh, you want your true error to be closer to the training error, right? Epsilon indicates their difference. Right? Then the more, the larger the, upper, the lower bound of the training examples, right? Say less than epsilon. This is just talking about if you want the difference between your true error and the training error is less than epsilon. Meaning that the difference, the relative uh, difference between your true error and the uh, training error less than some uh, level epsilon, then how many training examples at least you need. But in a consistent learner, we, what we're saying is okay, if uh, you have uh, enough training examples, the, the actual level of true error is less than epsilon with high chance, right? So this is the difference. Why? Because in agnostic learning, you cannot guarantee zero training error. So zero training, you have to account for non-zero training error. That's why in our conclusion, what you can say about is only the relative uh, difference between your true error and uh, training error. So this is, a, this is a key difference. So don't be confused here. Any any questions so far? Everyone's comfortable with this? Hopefully it's not very obstructive. Right? Okay. So again, let me emphasize the key point here. Right? Excellent here. Indicates the difference between the generalization and training error, not just the actual level of the generalization error. It's just the difference between the generalization and training error. You have to account for the training error in the advanced learning settings. And here, we can see that 
But uh, agnostic learning, the sample com complexity bound also includes the size of hypothesis space. <coughs> so that means the Occam's Rizus principle is uh, justified again, right? So to achieve the same difference between the training error and the true error, if your hypothesis space is smaller, meaning that you choose a smaller, uh, 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 easier, a less complex hypothesis space, uh, uh, the required number of training examples will be smaller. Okay? That's why we should favor the Occam's research principle. And also, this delta uh, determines the sample complexity bound as well. Right? If you want to increase the confidence level, you got to uh, supplement more training examples. And further, if we can switch epsilon to m, by right, meaning that, okay, we're going to fix number of training examples. And then we can get the so called generalization error bound. This is a bound telling us how much the true error will deviate from the training error. So the bound is in this way. Right? This is a very simple to derive by just a uh, switch epsilon to m. And, and now we can claim that, suppose. We are given m in examples, then with high probability, at least one less delta, the generalization error is upper bounded by the training error plus this term. So actually, this is a probabilistic bound telling us what's the difference between the true error and the generalization uh, and the training error. So we can mm -hmm. sort of a Weird question. Is the reason we see the opposite of this when we start like letting our trees get super deep, essentially because we're creating a huge hypothesis space and that's making it so that even though training error goes down, generalization error starts to go up? Uh, that's a good question. Yeah, you can you can build that one. Like because of, uh, when you let your trees mm -hmm. so there must be some trade off in between, which is optimal. Not like you want to have the maximum depth of the tree, right? Then that that will make that might be if you very small tree network, but very big disturb, right? And you must find some 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 depths of uh, right in between to get best tree off. Any other question? So this generalization error bound is very, very important. We'll see that later, how this bound uh, motivates the development or invention of the support machines. OK. So now, uh, before we wrap up with uh, agnostic learning, like, uh, we just want to contrast with two, contrast the two learning settings. One is con called consistent learning, where we always guarantee uh, our zero, our training error is simply zero, right? And also agnostic learning, where the true uh, concept or the target function might be outside of capacity space, so your training error is not necessarily zero. And then, for both learning settings, we derive sample complexity bound, right? But you can see that their form is quite similar. That's quite similar. And the learnability, both, in both cases, the learnability depends on the logarithm, the size of the space. That's very interesting. But just be aware of the difference between uh, the two conclusions. Right? The first conclusion tells us if m is bigger than this, then we can guarantee the learn hypothesis whose true error is strictly less than epsilon with high chance. right? But here, the second one. The conclusion is different. If m is bigger than this, then the true error, the difference, the true error, the difference between the true error and the training error is less than epsilon. Not just the absolute level of the true error less than epsilon. So this is a key difference. But if you just look at the form of the sample complexity bound, it's really, really same. Right? And the both sample com complexity bounds dependent on the size log size of the hypothesis space, which reflects the complexity or the expressiveness of your hypothesis space. Right? But what is the problem here?
have you got a happy ending? Seems like a true error could be really huge, right? You don't know if this Yeah, 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 definitely, definitely. But other than that, I mean, those are just estimates of the true error. But, uh, but other than that, uh, I mean, just in terms of the sample complexity bonds, uh, what things can make you uh, frustrated? Any thoughts? Is it hard to know how far off you are? Oh, how far uh, we are is actually can be uh, described by this uh, generalization error bound, right? So as long as you can calculate the logarithm size of space. Right? Okay. Yeah. But actually the problem has been pointed out by, uh, by you guys uh, several uh, before the four page. Right? When we talk about consistent learning. That is here. We assume the hypothesis space is finite. Right? So that you can calculate logarithm size hypothesis space, which is just a number. Right? But what if your hypothesis space is infinite? Okay. So uh, even for the simple linear classifiers, the hypothesis space is infinite. Why? Because all the feature weights and bus parameters, they're continuous. They're real value numbers, right? You have an infinite number of choices. In that case, the logarithm of size of hypothesis space will be uh, Infinity, and then your sample complexity bound is actually uh, nonsense. It's not meaningful at all, right? You say, okay, if m is bigger than infinity, well, you can get whatever error level on the whatever confidence level, right? That that is not uh, that is not practical. Confidence uh, contains both rectangles and seventeen sides on my confidence. So there, it is more. Expressive or it, it has a larger capacity. Right? A second example is like linear threshold functions versus combination of linear threshold functions, right? So you can imagine any linear threshold function can be viewed as one combination of linear threshold functions, right? But not vice versa. Right? I can combine three different lines together. That actually gives you a, a highly nonlinear boundary, right? which cannot be represented by any linear plasma. Although these two spaces are even. So obviously, obviously, we do need some kind of measurement to differentiate the capacity or the expressiveness of different hypothesis spaces. Even there, they contain uh, infinite uh, elements. So this motivates the so-called Wagner uh, travel magnetic dimension, abbreviated as VC dimension. The VC dimension provides such a measure for both finite and infinite hypothesis spaces. And uh, we can use VC dimension of a hypothesis space to describe or measure the capacity of that space and use that to, de to derive sample complexity bound or an end generalization error bound in both agnostic learning and consistent learning settings. Okay, so before we uh, talk about the definition of the VC dimension, right? so uh, I want to use a, a more concrete example to highlight why it's important in computational learning theory. Right? So we just use this uh, uh, like similar silly example. Right? So suppose we want to learn a rectangle classifier. Right? It's very simple classifier. This is our target function, the true concept. Right? So every point inside this rectangle classifier are positive and all sides are negative. So we want to give given a set of training examples, we want to learn a rectangle classifier which to be as close to the ground truth rectangle classifier as possible. At the beginning, well you only have these three examples while you learn rectangle classifier with like that, we know that there's a huge gap between your learned classifier and the ground truth, right? And with the increase of the 
training examples. You can build that whole thing uh, with more training examples. The learn classic part is getting closer to the ground truth rectangle, right? So you can expect that with more and more training examples that uh, your learn rectangle classic part will get closer and closer to the ground truth classic part. And finally, I mean, in the end, we'll believe that your learn rectangle can be actually close to the ground truth rectangle. That's the intuition. But how do you show that? How do you estimate how many training examples uh, would you need to achieve the epsilon difference between your learn rectangle and the ground truth rectangle? Right? Remember, this is a topic, or this is a key question the computer learning theory wants to answer. Right? To answer this question, we need some measurement of the capacity of the express phase of your rectangle classifier hypothesis space. Okay. I hope hopefully this gives you enough motivation for the missing dimension. Right? We do need some uh, uh, finite measurement which can reflect the expressiveness, expressiveness or capacity of hypothesis space, even the hypothesis space itself might contain infinite elements, infinite choices. So when you say expressiveness, what does it exactly mean for that So exactly means that, okay, how, what kind of, uh, expressiveness means, means that, what, what kind of, uh, uh, how flexible it can represent or classify complex cases. Like you have a template, um, in whatever labels of these templates, can you always find a corresponding classifier in a hypothesis space to give correct prediction? Okay. So we're gonna reach reach to this point right now. Any other question? Okay, that's a great question. So <clears throat> this dimension is defined on the concept of shadowing. Shadowing actually defines what you just mentioned, the expressiveness. So what we want to uh, look at the expressive, uh, expressiveness or expressivity of uh, lines, for example. Right? Suppose our hypothesis basis are just lines in the, uh, in the, uh, on the planes, right? So we want to, uh, we, uh, just for a line experiment, right? we want to say, uh, if I use these lines to classify two points, right? how good, how well can we do? Right? But suppose you are given two points. Right? So you can consider all kinds of uh, uh, possible labeling some of these two points. They actually, you have four possible labeling schemes. Right? Positive, negative, two negative, uh, negative, positive, and two uh, positive. Right? So we we'll see that, okay, for every possible labeling scheme, we can always find a corresponding line in our hypothesis space which correctly predict labels. Okay. So you can see that for uh, one positive here, one negative here, you find a line here, well, you correctly predict both labels, right? If all points are labeled as uh, negative, right, you just place a line here, you give correct predictions. And similarly, uh, for the other, for the remaining labeling schemes, you can find a corresponding uh, classifier which perfectly uh, predicts the label. Right? So, from this simple experiment, you can see that it is possible to draw a line that separates positive and negative points in all labeling schemes. Right? In this case, we can uh, we are confident to say that okay, our line has positive space are enough to shatter two points. Linear functions are expressive enough to shatter two points. Right? What about 14 points? Can our line classifiers uh, expressive enough to shatter 14 points? 
Any thoughts? Yes, exactly, right? But when we say, okay, we can share that, that means that, okay, for every possible labeling scheme, you should be able to correctly, correctly predict those labels. That's quite a strong work requirement, right? That will, that will be possible. Okay. So for this simple case, right, okay, you put lambda half points as positive and uh, the remaining half of the example is the negative, well you can find a line which can uh, perfectly separate them, meaning that they can correctly predict every label, right? But what if uh, you mix the labels in this way, right? You will never be able to find a line to give up uh, into positive and negative examples. We can find a corresponding function in each that gives exactly these labels to the example. So this is a very strong requirement. Okay. <clears throat> to claim that your hypothesis space H can shatter example set S, you need to ensure that for every possible labeling scheme of example set S, you can find a function in H that correctly predict those labels for every possible labeling scheme. That is called shadow. Then, and intuitively, if your hypothesis space has a richer set of functions, then you can expect that they can shadow a larger set of points. Any question regarding the definition? So now, let us use some examples to deepen our understanding of this shadow definition, right? We're looking over a set of uh, infinite hypothesis spaces and see how many points can they shadow, right? So the example one is called length bounded intervals. So each classifier is represented, represented by a long length bounded interval. So the left end is zero, fixed, right? Right end is A. So A is kind of a free parameter which must be positive. So all the examples uh, inside this uh, left body interval are classified as positive, outside classified as negative, right? So obviously, the left body equals can shadow one point, right? So, uh, If you have some point, right, uh, see here, if it is uh, when you give the label as positive, you can make A on the right, right? It gives the correct prediction. If uh, it is, uh, if, if the label is active, you can put A on the left hand side. So you can give the correct prediction, right? But is it able to share the two points? Yeah, I saw someone shake the head, right? <laughs> Say no, right? We can take a look, right? So suppose I, I'm giving two points, right? Remember, shadow means that, okay, for every possible label in this game, they can find an instance which can correct predict labels, right? So these are my two points. Suppose I give the left point a negative label and positive label. To the right point, right? you will see that we're never able to find a left bounded interval which can predict correctly predict both labels. Why? We can do a little bit of analysis, right? If we put A here, right, left to the left point, all the points. Both points will be labeled as positive, right? If you put A here, right? Right to the right point. Both points are labeled as uh, predicted as positive, right? If you put in between, well, you put, you, you, you're gonna label, you're gonna predict the negative uh, point as positive, 
and cost for the snap distance. So now you can see how weak these less bonded intervals are. Right? So although they are infinite amounts of spaces, they can only shatter one point. They cannot shatter two points. I'm having a hard time um, differentiating the thing this between this shattering concept and like atoms and using like lazy learners. Like, is, am I just missing something? It seems like because you can use lazy learners to learn functions, like we did in atoms. Oh, right now we're not talking about um, how to learn that. We're just talking about. Uh, what you're talking about lazy learners is talking about how do you search those hypotheses in a hypothesis space. Right? right now, just assume that okay, you're given this hypothesis space. Right? And uh, we're not talking about how to reach out to a specific hypothesis. We're talking about if there exists a hypothesis which can correctly label, um, correctly predict all the labels. Like, you can say even for the existent statement, you cannot satisfy this. Right? Because when you label your two points in this way, throughout the whole hypothesis space, you won't find any instance which can correctly predict both labels. Okay, so now let us increase the flexibility a little bit more. Right? Now my hypothesis space is intervals, free intervals, meaning that okay, both left and right end are free parameters. We we'll only need to uh, satisfy that B bigger than A, right? otherwise it won't be a valid. So we see that, okay, uh, again, I mean, our classifier uh, is defined the same as the left bounded interval. All the points inside the interval are classified as positive, outside negative. Okay? So this point, this uh, interval, three intervals, this hypothesis space are flexible enough to shatter one point and two points, which I'm not gonna uh, explain. Right? I will leave it as an exercise for you. Right? But it cannot shatter three points. So just a random pick up three points here, right? And I, I'm considering a specific labeling scheme where the two right ends, uh, two ends, right? left and right end points are labeled as positive. And in the middle, right? So you will find that you will never be able to find an interval classifier which can correct label all the three examples. So you can try that. If you put A here and B here, and the, the other two outside labels, outside uh, points are labeled as empty, which is wrong, right? If you put A here and B here, the other two points, the first one and the second points, are labeled as empty. Which are now right, right, right? You could put in between while well, you make wrong prediction for all the three. Right? So I'll, I'll leave it as an exercise for you to just by this point. It's actually, uh, the free interval hypothesis space is more flexible than left bounding interval space. In that, okay, now they can shatter two points, but they cannot shatter three points. So you can see that their expressiveness is still quite limited. Now, if they switch to lights, or in other words, half spaces in the plane, we'll see that it is, uh, this is an even more expressive uh, hypothesis space. Because it can shatter one point, it can shatter two points, it can shatter, can, it, can it shatter three points. This is something we're interested in, right? How can, how can we examine if they can shatter three points? Yeah, there's no, there's no tricks on that. You just need to enumerate all possible labeling schemes. And for all possible labeling schemes, you can find, you can, you can, you can test uh, if you can find a hypothesis, which is a line which can correct predict all the three uh, labels. Right? Actually, because you have three points, you actually have eight possible labeling schemes, right? And for every labeling scheme, we can find a corresponding line which perfectly separate positive and negative examples, meaning that they give a correct prediction of all the uh, labels. Then we'll conclude that, okay, linear classifiers on a plane 
Cash out at three points. In other words, linear classifiers are more, even more expressive than that free interval space, right? But how about four points? Can linear classifiers on the plane shadow four points? Yeah, intuition is correct. In our class, uh, in our uh, homework assignment, uh, there is a bonus question asking you to show that. Right? And if you're interested in doing that, or well, well, it's kind of like a little bit tedious, but just follow the definition. You know, in all possible layouts of the four points, and for each layout where you examine the label and scheme, you'll find that not any uh, layout of four points uh, for every possible label and scheme, you can find a corresponding uh, linear classifier which gives prior prediction. So you can see that shadow is, is like playing a closer game. So, you play that your hypothesis is class H can shatter these key points, and a closer says, okay, that's where you think. Look at this label and scheme, right? Can you, uh, can you, can you win it, right? And you're working out some hypothesis in a hypothesis space, right? And that correctly predicts your evil labeling. And then the uh, 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 will propose another tricky label and scheme and challenge you and say if you can. Uh, you can give the correct uh, prediction by finding a specific function in the hypothesis space. You do this again and again, and finally you can end up with the conclusion if your hypothesis space can share these points or not. So if you have a hypothesis space H which can share an arbitrary large number of uh, instance in the instance space, then we claim that a hypothesis space can share an infinite number of points. So this is kind of like a subtle uh, definition. So don't think of like, okay, if someone said, okay, a hypothesis space can share an infinite number of points, meaning that they can really share an infinite number of points. It's just saying, okay, you can give arbitrary number of finite points. Your hypothesis space can share them. And intuitively, the larger the subset of uh, uh, instance space that can be shattered, the more expressive the hypothesis space H is. Any question regarding the definition of shattering? Hopefully those uh, examples can give you a concrete um, uh, idea about how this is defined, like how it is. It, it reflects the idea of the uh, uh, expressiveness of passing. Okay, now we can take a look at uh, the definition of the VC dimension. Right? As we just mentioned, right, the VC dimension is defined on the concept shadow. So the formal definition is as follows. The VC dimension of a hypothesis space H over instance space X is the size of the largest finite subset of X that can be shattered by H. So two key points here inside this definition, right? that which can be easily confused. Uh, people are easily confused here. So if there exists any subset of size D that can be shattered, then we claim that the VC dimension of your hypothesis space H is bigger than the label C. Even one subset. So don't get confused here. Um, if your VC dimension is bigger than or equal to D, as long as you can find one subset of size D which can be shattered. It does not require you to ensure every subset of size D to be shattered. Okay. So as long as you can find a subset of size D which can be shattered, then you can claim you can say the term, okay, your basic dimension is uh, at least a D. Okay. It doesn't require you to shatter every subset of size D. So don't 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 get confused here because many 
uh, many people are confused at this point. So secondly, only when no subset of size D can be shattered, the least dimension is less than D. So it's kind of like a, a little bit weak condition. As long as you have one subset of size D that can be shattered, then you can claim, okay, my least dimension is at least D. Right? Only when no subset of size D can be shattered. Okay, you can claim, okay, my, my base dimension cannot be D, right? Must be less than D. That, that is why it's defined as, okay, it is the largest, the size of the largest finite subset F that can be shattered H. This is the dimension. So if you want to show that, okay, the least dimension of your all classifiers is three, what you need to do is just to show that, okay, you can find three points, whatever three points, whatever layoffs, uh, they can be shattered by Yakubas and space. At the same time, you need to show that any subset of uh, points of size four cannot be shattered by Yakubas and space. Okay, any question regarding the definition of this dimension? Okay, great. So uh, let's stop here um, and see you on 